So good evening all. A warm welcome to the research, sorry, the webinar series on research methodology, jointly <laughs> organized by Researchers Forum, Department of Commerce and IQSC Government College Attingal. Actually, we started our series on uh, last month, the 26th August. So in the introductory uh, session, we had a technical session on academic writing basics. The subject expert was uh, Dr. T. G. Saji. He is an uh, associate professor, School of Management Studies, Kusat. So based on the feedback received from the uh, participants then, many suggested a topic on sample size determination. So that is why we, we organized a, a webinar on uh, the topic sample size determination and uh, we find a resource person who is apt for this particular topic, Dr. P. N. Harigumar. Dr. P. N. Harigumar is a statistical analyst from the Faculty of Commerce. So in this uh, webinar, another, okay, sir. So, okay, sir, okay. So uh, in this session, in this technical session, we have with us Dr. Gracious James, the Associate Professor and Research Supervisor of Government College Attingham, who will act as the moderator for the whole session. So now I invite Dr. Gracious James to uh, moderate the session and to introduce the resource person. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. A warm welcome once again to all. Okay. <clears throat> I hope that I am audible to all. Respected principal, the resource person for today's session, Professor Dr. P. N. Harigumar, Professor Sunilas and other faculty members, scholars and friends. Good evening to all. As you know, this program is the part of a web series organized by the Researchers Forum and the Department of Commerce and Research Center, Government College, Ittingen. And I am extremely happy and privileged to introduce our resource person, Professor Dr. P. N. Hariguma. He is having two PhDs, one in commerce and another in management. In addition to his postgraduate degree, MPhil and MBA. He is currently working as professor of the School of Business Management Legal Studies, University of Kerala, Kairiwad. He is a member of the Faculty of Management member University Research Committee of Mahatma Gandhi University, Kota. He is member of Board of Studies in Management, PG, Kannur University, member Board of Studies in Commerce, PG, University of Kerala, member University Research Committee, Kannur University, member Research Committee of the Kerala State Higher Education Council. And he is handling sessions in the UGC HRDCs of different universities all over India. He is a life member of Indian Commerce Association, Indian Accounting Association, and Commerce and Management Association of India. He is acting as the chief editor of two reputed journals, that is KG's Journal of Social Science and Commerce and Management Explorer. And he is also a leader he is the former general secretary of the All Kerala Private College Teachers Association. And after all, he is a dedicated academician and a teacher. Today, he will explain the various aspects related to sample size calculation. Definitely, he will cover the statistics behind the fixation of sample size along with its theoretical background in a very simple and lucid style. And I am sure that it will be uh, helpful to all the participants, especially to th those researchers who are in the beginning stages of their research work. And all of you know this will be a one and a half hour session. You can clarify your doubts towards the end of the session. And for that, please put your doubts and questions in the chat box. 
and Professor Harikumar will answer these questions towards the end of the session. And uh, please note that all the participants, please uh, mute your audio and video uh, with a due respect and regards. And I invite Professor Dr. P. N. Harigumar to handle the session. And it's over to Professor Dr. P. N. Harigumar. Thank you. Thank you, gracious sir. Thank you for your uh, inspiring words about me. I think many times uh, your department, the research department of your college conducted workshop on research methodology, especially the application of statistical techniques in research, SPSS software, then greater software and EVU software. And uh, I have attended so many workshops in your college as a research person. So today, I congratulate you for uh, selecting a very, very technical topic of research methodology, the sample size determination. Because I have experienced many questions answered by experts, either in the pre submission seminar or open defense of PhD program. The serious question is why the research scholar applied simple random sampling? Or why you applied multi stage random sampling? But unfortunately, almost all the research scholars have not answered that question properly. So that is why I should say. This is a very, very relevant topic, something technical in research methodology. So before going to the details of sampling and the determination of optimum sample size, I just explain what is research, the steps involved in research, then sampling, methods of sampling, and how to determine the optimal sample size for your survey. And this is the structure of my presentation. And uh, shall I share my PPT? Gracious sir, can you see my PPT? Yes, sir. Now it's uh, visible. Okay. Thank you. So coming to the basic meaning of the term research. In many books, you can find some definition for research. Search for new knowledge, additions to existing knowledge, scientific inquiry. Here I should say the appropriate meaning of research is scientific inquiry. So research means inquiry for new knowledge. So in social science, we need that definition. Research means scientific inquiry. But what is the difference between scientific research and the social science research? In scientific research, the outcome will be natural truth, scientific truth. Say for example, S2O, two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen will give water. This is a scientific truth. When you do that particular experiment n number of times, the output will be the same. 
two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen will give water. If you repeat that experiment n number of times, the output will be the same. 2 plus 2, 4. And 2 plus 2 may not be 5, may not be 3. That is why the outcome of scientific research is a natural truth or scientific truth. But the social science research is something different from scientific research. In social science research, the research work is based on certain assumptions. We try to establish the relationship. That relationship may be an assumed relationship. Such assumption has to be proved. That means one factor is affected by another factor. One factor is related to another factor. The second factor is again related to some other factors. So there is a network of relationship among variables. Chain of relationship among these variables. And based on some relation, uh, based on the relation, we have certain assumptions. <coughs> We may have assumed a relationship among n number of variables classified into dependent and independent. Such a relationship may be only an assumption. And such assumed relationship has to be proved or validated. Validated with the data. So in social science research, the starting point is selection of an area. The researcher has to select an area for his research. From that area, he has to identify a topic. In that topic, the researcher has to search for a problem. The researcher has to identify a problem in the topic related to an area. Then the problem has to be defined and redefined. Make the problem more clear. Which means, lot of sub-problems have to be identified from the main problem. For that purpose, there is literature. As a researcher, as a supervising teacher, definitely I should say, literature review is basically the first point. The first step in research. One person who is willing to do research must review all the available literature relating to n number of topics in different areas. So as a supervising teacher, as a researcher, definitely I should inform all the research scholars literature review is the base for selection of an area or identifying a topic for research or explain the problem involved in that research or so many sub-problems that have to be identified from the main problem. For all these, literature review is the first step. Without having sufficient literature review, nobody can do research. So that is the relevance of literature review. So, for example, in the area of finance, the topic is sugar industry. The problem identified, almost all the sugar manufacturing units, once functioning in our state, were declared as sick. Why? Because they were running at a loss. Why? Because the expenditure exceeds revenue. Why? Because all the elements of cost are increasing at an alarming rate. Why, 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 why? N number of ways have to be identified by the researcher. So, like a way, the problem, the main problem has to be defined in a simple and lucid manner. Defined and redefined. That means from the main problem, the researcher has to identify the N number of sub-problems. What is the main problem here? 
almost all the sugar manufacturing units once functioning in our state were declared as sick. Why? Because they were running at a loss. Again, why? Because expenditure exceeds revenue. Again, why? So, n number of sub problems have to be identified as the main problem. Another example in the area of marketing consumer behavior. Consumer behavior towards fast moving goods. What are the factors affecting the behavior of consumers? What are the factors affecting the purchase decision of the consumers? After purchasing and using a product, the customer gets satisfied. So what will be the outcome of satisfaction? Trust and loyalty? What will be the outcome of trust and loyalty, whether it is brand equity? If we have a positive brand equity, there may be the possibility of brand extension. Why, 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 why? Any number of sub-problems have to be identified in the main problem. Another example of human resource, in the area of human resource. What are the factors affecting global satisfaction? Any number of factors affecting global satisfaction. What will be the outcome of job satisfaction? Maybe institutional commitment. And what will be the outcome of commitment? Maybe institutional loyalty. So likewise, the researcher has to select an area, identify a topic, then define the problem in a better way. N number of sub-problems have to be identified from the main problem or that purpose. Literature review must be there. Extensive literature review. Then only the problem has to be properly defined. If a problem is defined properly or make the problem more clear, definitely the researcher will be in a position to find out the exact answer. Or he or she may have an assumed answer to the problem already defined. That assumed answer, tentative solution, is called a hypothesis. So what is hypothesis? Hypothesis is basically the relationship between independent variable and the dependent variable. The assumed relationship between dependent variable and independent variable is called hypothesis. If we frame a hypothesis, definitely it should involve the relationship between dependent variable and independent variable. If your statement will not have any relationship between dependent variable and independent variable, that is, cannot be termed as hypothesis. So in social science research, there may be some assumptions with regard to the relationship between dependent variable and independent variable. Such assumed relationship will be called a hypothesis. And if a researcher formulates a hypothesis or assumed relationship between dependent variable and independent variable, such a relationship has to be proved or validated with the data. So data has to be collected only for validate the assumed relationship between dependent variable and independent variable. And I have already mentioned what is the specific future of social science research. Simply, there will be the relation, network of relationship. There will be chain of relationship among variables. Such a variable may be classified into dependent variable and independent variable. The assumed relationship between dependent variable and independent variable is called a hypothesis. Such a hypothesis may not be seen in scientific research. In social science research, everything is based on assumed relationship between independent variable and independent variable. Such a relationship is called hypothesis. And that hypothesis must be validated properly. For that purpose, there is the need for data. Data may be either primary data or secondary data. So, what will be the type of data, whether it is primary or secondary? If we collect either primary data or secondary data, there will be an inquiry. That is why I have already mentioned, research is a scientific inquiry. So, 
two types of inquiries, census and summary. Two methods of inquiry, census and summary. So, after collecting the data through either census inquiry or sampling inquiry, there will be the data analysis. Data has to be analyzed for proving or validating our hypothesis. Data may be either secondary data or primary data. Such a data has to be collected by conducting an inquiry either in the form of census or in the form of sampling. So basically two methods of inquiry, census and sampling. Census means if we collect data from all the units in the population, it is called a census. If we collect data from all the teachers in Attingal Government College, it is called a census. I think more than 50 teachers are working in Attingal Government College. And we want to study their spending pattern. For that purpose, if we collect data from all the teachers working in this college, it is called a census inquiry. 60 teachers are working there. Instead, I collect data from 30 teachers selected either random or non-random basis. It is called a sampling. So, two methods of inquiry, census inquiry and summary inquiry. So, after collecting the data, data has to be analyzed to prove the hypothesis already formulated. Basically, three types of analysis, bivariate, univariate and multivariate. Univariate analysis, bivariate analysis and multivariate analysis. See, coming to sampling. From this side onwards, definitely we will face some technical definitions of certain terms and concepts used in the such methodology. Sampling. So here population, the universe of the units from which the sample is to be selected. That means all the units under study constitute population. So, for example, work-life balance of women managers in SBI. Work-life balance of women managers in SBI. All the women managers working in State Bank of India constitute our population. That means, if we collect data from all the units of the population, all the units under study, it is called a population. A collection of items about which some inference is to be made. Then another technical time sampling. The segment of the population that is selected for investigation, it is a subset of the population. Any part of the population is called a sample. See, I want to study the spending pattern of all the teachers working in government college at Tingle. 60 teachers are working at present. If I collect information from all the 60 teachers working in the college, here the population consisting of 60. So this is called a census inquiry. I collect information from all the units in the population. Instead, I select only 30 teachers from among 60 teachers working at present in government college at Dingle. This 30 is my sample. So what is sampling? So sampling is basically the process of selecting a part of the population. For our research work, we select n number of fixed units from the population, including 
number of units and that process is called as sampling. Selection of sample from the population and that process is called as sampling. So there are two assumptions based on the selection of the sample. The first assumption, the parent population from where the sample have been drawn is normally distributed. This is the first condition under which sample has to be selected from the population. The parent population from where the sample have been drawn is normally distributed. The second assumption or second condition, the sample selected will be true representative of the population. If we select n number of sample from the population, that sample will be true representative of the population. Sample must represent the population under study. These are the two very, very important condition or assumption upon which we choose sample study, sample survey. The first one, the parent population from where the sample have been drawn is normally distributed. The sample selected will be the true representative of the population. These two are the basic condition upon which a researcher has to choose for a sample study. So why a sample? If we choose a sample design or sample survey, definitely it has certain advantage. The cost will be low, greater accuracy of research, speedy data of collection, and availability of population elements. These are the merits of sample. Why we choose a sample survey? These are the answers. Then what are the merits and demerits of census? The study involving all elements in the population. That means we collect data from all the elements in the population. It is very flexible because only when the population is small. But there is a, a demerit necessary when elements are quite different from each other. So these are the features of census inquiry. Again, what are the different types of population? If we collect information from all the units, definitely it is a census inquiry. So what are the different types of population? Finite population or unfinite population? That means known and unknown population. And what is the merit of finite population? The value of population parameter can be estimated. If we have a finite population or non population, definitely we can calculate the parameter, population parameter. Maybe mean, median, more, standard deviation, whatever. But in the case of infinite population, Value parameter, population parameter can be estimated, but it is very difficult because the population is very large. Population is unknown, infinite. Again, population may be classified into homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homogeneity of all the units in the population. And all the units are different. There is no homogeneity, that means we can find heterogeneity in the population. The unit under study are not identical or similar. Or the units under study have no homogeneity, no similarity. Such a population is called a heterogeneous population. Then again, what is a good sample? Validity of sample depends on accuracy and precision. If we need accuracy of the output, accuracy of the results, or more precision in our results, theoretically we say that sample survey is better, better than census survey.
So there are certain problems associated with the sampling management. Non-probability sampling and probability sampling. That means, I think we must select a sample from the population. If we apply the concept of probability, such a selection is called a probability sampling. And if we will not apply the concept of probability, such a selection of sample from the population is called a non-probability sampling. So what is probability? Theoretically means chance of happening or not happening of an event. What is the meaning of the application of probability at the time of the selection of sample from the population? That means every unit in the population has an equal chance of being a sample. That is the meaning of the application of probability at the time of selection of sample from the population. Say for example, in Attinger College, 60 teachers are working at present. My sample size is 30. How to select 30 teachers from among teacher, 60 teachers working in this college? How to select 30 teachers from among 60? That means, at the time of application of probability concept, for the selection of sample from the population, there is a condition, there is an assumption. Every teacher working in this college has an equal chance of being included in my 30 optimal sample size. So that is the meaning of the application of probability concept at the time of the selection of sample from the population. This is called a probability sample. If the researcher has no application of probability concept at the time of the selection of the sample from the population, then the method is called a non-probability sampling. So non-probability sampling is a selection of a unit arbitrary or subjective basis. Items are chosen with a pattern in mind. That means the selection of the sample from the population is fully dependent on the discretion, the convenience, or the judgment of the researcher. That means nowhere the application of probability concept. But in the case of probability sampling, it is based on random selection, selection of a unit at random. That means a controlled procedure that assures a non-probability of selection of for each item. Definitely we have an idea about the probability of choosing an item from the population. Theoretically and practically we have a probability. We calculate a probability for the selection of the sample from the population. It is a random sample. Why? Because all the items have an equal chance of being selected. That means every unit in the population has an equal chance of being included in the sample size of the researcher. That is why there is the relevance of probability sampling. The steps in sample design. What is the target population? What is the nature of the population? Whether it is homogeneous, whether it is heterogeneous, or finite population, or infinite population, and what are the parameters of interest? What is the sampling frame? Total number of units, the description of all the units included in the population. And what is the appropriate sampling method? Whether it is probability sampling or non probability sampling. And what is the size of the sample? What is your optimum size of sample size? And all this depends on the problem, research problem. Depends on the hypothesis you have already formulated. Then depends on the variation in the population. 
That is very, very important variation. Variation is very, very essential for interpretation after analyzing the data. So, for example, in a classroom, 30 girls and 25 boys out of 55 students. The marks obtained by boy students, the marks obtained by girl students, they have the observations. They have the data with us. Definitely two groups, boys and girls. We can calculate the average marks obtained by girl students, the average marks obtained by boy students. The average marks obtained by gay students for research methodology, 55. Average marks obtained by boy students, the same value, 55. No variation. No interpretation. Who is much brilliant? No, we can't interpret it. Because in the data we have no variation. But the average marks obtained by gay students for research methodology 55, average marks obtained by boys for research methodology 45. So we have variation in our data. So based on such a variation, we can interpret the results in a better way. So that is why variation is very, very essential for interpretation after getting the data analyzed. Or at the time of collection of data or analysis of data, variation is an essential element for getting valid results, valid output, and consequently we will interpret such research in a better way. So variation is very, very important. See, in the probability sampling, we have a simple random sampling, systematic sampling, cluster sampling, stratified random sampling, and a double sampling. In the non-probability herd, we have convenience sampling, purpose sampling, judgment sampling, quota sampling, and snowball sampling. So many methods are available. And I will explain the important methods one by one. See, simple random sampling. The simple random sampling is applied based on certain conditions. Population must be finite and small, the first condition. Population must be homogeneous. There will not be any heterogeneity in the population. And the availability of sources is there. If we have proper source list about the population, and if such a population is homogeneous, found to be homogeneous, and then if the population is finite or small, simple random sampling must be applied. These are the basic conditions upon which the simple random sampling can be applied. In my first PhD, my topic was social security schemes of LIC. And such schemes are availed only a few beneficiaries, maybe less than 500. So the population is finite. Beneficiaries are are having common features, so there is homogeneity, and the source list is obtained from the LIC office. So I apply symbol random sampling. And stratified random sampling, another method. And this method can be applied only when the population is found to be heterogeneous. There is no homogeneity that can be seen in the population. In order to get homogeneity, we will apply stratified random sampling. That means the population is divided into several parts, n number of parts. Each part is called a strata. From each strata, we select units at random. 
So for example, if we have a heterogeneous population, we divide such a population into four strata, strata one, strata two, strata three, strata four. By dividing the population into four strata, automatically we must ensure homogeneity. Then we select required number of sample proportionately from each strata we already created. And the sample selected from each strata constitute our optimal sample size. So this method can be applied only when the, hom the population is found to be homogeneous. Then in order to ensure, sorry, the population is found to be heterogeneous and in order to ensure homogeneity in the population, we divide the entire population into different groups and each group is called strata and we select sample from all the strata already created and finally we will get the optimum sample size for our study. And cluster sample, the first condition, this method is applied only when the population is very large. The population is very large. We divide the population into several group. Each group is called a cluster. Cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, cluster 4, cluster 5. Suppose in the population we found 50 cluster. Cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, up to cluster 50. Then we select only 3 cluster from the 50 cluster identified from the population, from the largest population. All the units in the three cluster identified from among 50 cluster already created and this will be our optimal sample size. The condition, the researchers have an idea about n number of groups in the population, that means cluster in the population. Each cluster should be small representation of the population. Each cluster should be mutually exclusive. Cluster is a sampling unit that we are trying to select at random and collect information on all the sampling units available in the selected clusters. So once again, cluster sampling is applied only when the population is very large. If the population is found to be very large, we create so many cluster, n number of clusters in the population. Say for example, cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, up to cluster 50. We identified 50 clusters, 50 groups in the population. Then we select three clusters at random from among the 50 clusters already we identified. We created in the population. Three clusters at random we selected. And all the units in the three clusters we already identified or selected will constitute the optimum sample size for our study. This is called a cluster sampling. A multi stage random sampling. This method is also applied when the population is found to be very large. Then the targeted population, see, if the population is very large, this is the appropriate method of sampling, multi-stage random sampling. And in the, from the population, large population, we will create a targeted population. How to create a targeted population? Say for example, customer satisfaction of public and private sector banks in Kerala. Customer satisfaction of public and private sector banks in Kerala. Large number of customers avail banking services from these banks, either public or private. Definitely the population is very large, found to be very large. And we divide the, our state into three zones. 
south, central, north. This is the first stage. And in the first stage, we identify Trivandrum district from south, Ernalan district from central, Calicut from north. Then we select a public sector bank, one bank from the south, one public sector bank from central, one public sector bank from north. Similarly, private sector bank, one bank has to be selected from south, one private sector bank again selected from Ernagulam, the central, and the similar procedure is followed in Calicut also the north region. Then, select one branch each from the public and private sector bank be selected from Trivandrum. One branch each from private and private sector, public sector bank be identified in Trivandrum. And the similar procedure is followed in Calicut also. And all the customers in the selected branches of public and private sector banks in Trivandrum, in Calicut, and in Ernagulam constitute our target population. So from the large population, we defined a target population. From the target population, we select the our optimum sample size for our study either proportionately or at random. So this is the multi-stage random sampling. Another one systematic sampling, the first condition, population is finished. First sample is selected at random. Remain, remaining samples were selected at regular intervals. So for example, women gynecologist in Kerala. We select 300 gynecologists from among 1,500 women gynecologists working in our state. Our sample size fixed was 300. Total number of gynecologists working in our state, that means the population, consisting of 1,500. So 1,500 divided by 300, the interval is 5. And we select the first gynecologists at random and possibly fortunately that gynecologist 10 gynecologists in the list we have the list of all the 1500 gynecologists working in our state we need a sample of 300 gynecologists only therefore the interval is 1500 divided by 300 is equal to 5 and we select the first gynecologist at random from among 1,500. And which is, that gynecologist is found to be the 10th gynecologist. Therefore, the next gynecologist will be the 15th in the list. And the third gynecologist we have to select is the 20th gynecologist. Because the interval here is 5. So this is called a systematic random sampling. So this is a very, very important section, something technical. What is sample size determination? The sample size determination is the mathematical est estimation of the number of subjects or units to be included in the study. It is the process of the estimation of the number of units to be included in a study. The number of units to be selected for conducting an inquiry. And that determination is called, that number determination is called a sample size determination. When a representative sample is taken from a population, the findings are generalized to the population. That is very important. What we will do in sample study? This is the question. Simply, after collecting data from the sample identified on the population, data has to be analyzed. Then we will get some statistic. Maybe the mean, median, more, or standard deviation. Or we calculate chi-square. Or we calculate F-value. Whatever it may be. 
This is the sample statistic. Based on this value of sample statistic, we interpret the result. Based on such interpretation, we generalize the characteristics of the population. This is what we will do in sample study. Statistically, we will put in another way. Sample statistic must be utilized for estimating or predicting the unknown value of the population. Sample statistic is used for predicting or estimating the unknown value of the population. That is why sampling is very, very important in research methodology. What we will do in sampling? Definitely, none of the research scholar answer is properly. In sample study, what we will do? Simply, the sample statistic must be utilized for estimating or predicting the unknown value of the population parameter. Practically, if we collect data from sample units from the population by using any one of the methods already explained whether it is simple under sampling or multi-stage under sampling or cluster sampling <coughs> or stratified under sampling whatever it may be we interpret the results of the sample survey sample data and based on the interpretation we generalize the features of the population. Then the optimal sample size determination is recorded for the following reason. To allow for appropriate analysis, provide the desired level of accuracy, and allow the validity of significant tests. If the sample size is optimum, Definitely, you can direct the testing of hypothesis or validate the hypothesis in a better direction. That means to allow validity of significant tests. And if the sample size is too large, what will happen? The study will be very difficult and costly. We need more time, much time. Loss of accuracy. Therefore, optimal sample size must be determined before the commencement of the study. So, before the selection of sample from the population, the researcher has to fix optimum sample size for his or her study. See, if the sample size is very large, definitely it will give more variation. Then procedure for calculating sample size. There are four procedures that could be used for calculating sample size. Majority of the research scholar uses formula. Majority of the research scholars use some formula for the determination of optimal sample size. The ready-made table is available. Sometimes no more grams. This is used in medical research. And some of the softwares, like a SPSO software, Gretel, Stacta, and such a softwares will have an option to determine some optimal sample size. But which is the most uh, valid method? As a researcher, as a research supervising teacher, I would prefer the use of some formula for the determination of sample size, optimal sample size. And basis for determining the sample size, specification of a precision level, level of confidence, power, the likelihood of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. These are uh, something technical, but uh, in a simple way, I would like to explain these three 
technical concepts, technical assumptions. Normally in social science, we fix the level of significance 5. 5% 5 level of significance. That means if we repeat an experiment n number of times, sorry, 100 times, 5% there may be the possibility of an error. This is called a 5% level of significance. In 95 cases, the outcome will be similar. You will get similar outcome in 95 cases, 95 times. Only 5 times we find some error. That is why there is 5% level of significance. But in, social, in science subjects, normally they choose 1% level of significance. The knowledge of the population parameter. How to get an idea about the characteristics of the population? So the first one, pilot study, pilot survey. Pilot study is very, very important in research. If the research scholar conducts a pilot study or preliminary investigation or pilot investigation, Definitely he or she should be in a position to identify the characteristics of the population, the behavior of the units included in the population. So that is why pilot studies, pilot survey, pilot investigation is very, very important in social science research. But unfortunately, many research scholars completed their research without having pilot study. See, Many, many formulas are there for the determination of sample size. The first one, Koshman's formula. Formula is this, n0 is equal to z square pq divided by e square. e is the desired level of precision. p is the estimated proportion of the population which has the attribute in question. 2 is 1 minus p. z value can be found out from the table. Is a table. Maybe 5% level of significance or 1% level of significance or 10% level of significance. We have definitely Z values found in the table. Then another formula is Z score formula. Necessary sample size. That means optimum sample size is equal to Z score. So there is a need for table, statistical table. It's a score square into standard deviation into 1 minus standard deviation divided by margin of error, maybe 5 percentage or 1 percentage or 10 percentage, whatever it may be, square. So in these two formula, there is a need for insert table. But this formula is much reliable. Why? This formula can be applied against the data collected from pilot study. What is the relevance of pilot study? If we conduct a pilot study, definitely the researcher may be in a position to identify the behavior of the population. Identify some idea about how many units included in the population. The common characteristics of the population that can be identified by the researcher at the time of conducting pilot study. So this formula can be applied against the data collected from pilot study. So, here the modified data after reliability analysis can be used to determine the sample size by studying the extent of variation in the responses. Definitely we have an idea about the variation found in the data collected through pilot study. It may be stated that the sample size is proportional to the level of variation and the assumed level of error of the estimate of the population parameter of the study variable. The formula used for determination of optimum sample size is 1.96 standard deviation divided by d square. n means sample size, s means estimate of the standard deviation, d the standard error of the estimation of the population parameter and 1.96 is what? It is a critical value from normal test at 5% level of significance. At 5% level of significance, the value is 1.96. So, 
So this is the important formula. This is the most reliable formula. Why? Because this formula is applied against the data collected through pilot study. That means if we apply this formula and find out the optimal sample size, the optimal sample size is based on the characteristics of the population, the exact population from where we identify the sample for our final, our final study. If we conduct final study and collect necessary data, and against that data, if we apply this formula, then find out the optimum sample size. Such an optimum sample size should have the common characteristics of the population from where we select the, our optimum sample for our final study. I'm sorry, our final study. So that is the relevance of this formula for the fixation of sample size. And another formula, Krajese and the Morgan model for sampling. And this is a good formula because this formula we can apply by identifying the chi-square value, table value. Chi-square, the table value of chi-square for one degrees of freedom at the desired conference level 3.841. But it doesn't consider the pilot study. Based on the table value of the chi-square at a fixed degrees of freedom. And that value may be used for the fixation of optimal sample size. It doesn't consider the actual population characteristics. So, I should say this is the best formula, valid formula for the fixation of optimum sample size. Why? Because this formula always consider the characteristics of the population, behavior of the population upon which we conduct the pilot study. This formula is applied against the data collected through pilot study. That is why this formula is the best formula for the fixation of optimum sample size. Then, here I will give a tips to fix the optimum sample size based on a pilot survey, a pilot study. This is a questionnaire for measuring the work-life balance of women gynecologists. The topic of research, the title of research, work-life balance of women gynecologists. This is a draft questionnaire, a structured questionnaire. Normally the first question name, second age, third qualification, Number of years of service, all these variables are in nominal scale, categorical variable. But you just observe the question number 19. What is the feature of question number 19? You are requested to mark your response on a seven point scale. So here, interval scale is used. <laughs> interval <laughs> scale is <laughs> Interval scale is used for measurement. So one of the variables affecting the work-life imbalance. One of the variables affecting the work-life imbalance of gynecologists, bad environment and climate in hospital, no peaceful ambience in hospital, emotional nature of work. So all these are the variables affects the work-life imbalance of the gynecologist. Similarly, so many variables identified. See, n number of variables identified. Starting from, starting from, bad environment and climate in hospital, 
no peaceful ambience in hospital, emotional nature of work, then impossible time management, no job clarity, no job control, more number of patients, negative reactions of family for long hours of working, emergency and unexpected work. So many variables identified and such variables affect the work life imbalance of women gynecologists. And all these variables are qualitative variable. That is very important, qualitative variable. So in order to measure such variable, such qualitative variables, many statements were used upon which the response were obtained from the selected gynecologists on a seven point scale basis, on a seven point scale basis. So totally 127 statements were used. 127 statements were used for the measurement of some variables that are attributed to the work-life conflict of women gynecologists working in our state. And all these variables identified were qualitative variables. And in order to quantify it or in order to measure such a variable, one 27 statements were used upon which the response may be obtained from the gynecologist on a seven point scale basis. So here the interval scale is used. And by using all the responses against 127 statements on a seven point scale basis, and we applied that particular formula, the valid formula, for the determination of optimum sample size. Optimum sample size. See, this is the entry of all the data for the 127 statements upon which response were obtained on a seven point scale basis. Say 127 statements against which the data may be obtained or the response may be obtained on a seven point scale basis, and we enter the data against 127 statements on a seven point scale basis in the Excel format. Here, the sample, sorry, the pilot study, we select a hundred gynecologists for conducting the pilot study. We select 100 gynecologists from the population for 127 statements against which the response may be obtained from all the 100 gynecologists on a seven point scale basis. So we have total 127 statements for the measurement of all the qualitative variable and we select 100 gynecologists from the population for our pilot study. So this is the data collected from the pilot study. That means for the pilot study, we select a hundred gynecologists and use 127 statements for getting their responses on a seven point scale basis and enter such a data in the MS Excel format. And how to apply that particular formula, the value the valid formula for the determination of sample size. So what is the valid formula here? The valid formula here is optimum sample size is equal to 1.96 standard deviation square divided by D. This is a valid formula. Why? Because this formula always consider the data collected through by the study and the data collected through pilot study should reveal the characteristics of the population. From where we select our optimal sample for our final study. So that is why this formula is 
much valid than other formula already explained. See, and I enter all the data collected from 100 gynecologists for our pilot study. We have 127 statements upon which the responses were obtained on a seven point scale basis. So, in order to apply this formula, definitely we should calculate standard deviation, then the mean, and also we have 1.96. That means the 5% level of significance. This is the critical value. 1.96 at 5% level of significance, the critical value. And how to apply this formula here? Firstly, we calculate mean. 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 Okay. Is equal to average. Mean means average. And if we calculate the average for the first column. In the first column, we have 100 observations. 100 observations. We select all the 100 observations in the first column. In the first column. Drag across. Click enter. So here, the mean value for the response of the 100 gynecologists against the first statement. We have 127 statement. Against the first statement, the mean value of the response, mean score of the response is equal to 3.52. Once again, I will demonstrate. Mean is equal to is equal to bracket average then we select all the observation 100 observation of the first column that means the statement number one then close the bracket and press enter So once again, is equal to average then select all the hundred observations in the first column. Close the bracket. Is equal to Average, select all the 100 observations in the first column. Bracket close. and click enter so the mean value is here 3.52 mean value is 3.52 3.52 is the mean value for 
the first column mean value for the first column three point five two The next one standard deviation, we find the standard deviation. So once again, mean, what to calculate? Equals average select all the hundred observation in the first column. That means the statement number one out of 127 then close the bracket enter so here the mean value for all the responses against the question number one statement number one for all the hundred observations here the mean value 3.52 then calculate standard deviation sb is equal to standard deviation STB EV standard deviation select all the hundred observation in the first column all the hundred observation in the first column Close the bracket. So standard deviation is equal to ST TVV standard deviation select all the hundred observations Close the brackets, enter. So here, the standard deviation for the first column. That means statement number one. Out of the 127 statements, we calculate standard deviation for the first column. Then, 
optimal sample size n is equal to is equal to here the critical value is 1.96 at 5% level of significance in the formula so in the formula the critical value is 1.96 so 1.96 into standard deviation into standard deviation 1.96 into standard deviation standard deviation already calculated standard deviation bracket cross square square means hat square means hat Two, that means square divided by in the formula d d means one point the standard error of the estimate of the population parameter so here divided by 0 0.05 that means our level of significance five percent level of significance means 0 0.05 into mean mean already calculated for the first column 3.52 bracket cross and square square means hat 2 and press enter so here the n that means the optimum sample size for the first statement 790.411. See, once again, we calculate mean, calculate standard deviation, and optimum sample size can be calculated by using this formula. That means optimum sample size is equal to 1.96. The critical value of FISA at a 5% level of significance. Standard deviation into standard deviation. Square divided by D, the standard error of the estimate of the population parameter. So for that purpose, we calculate mean, standard deviation, then apply that formula. And against that formula, how to apply is equal to 1.96 into standard deviation already calculated. Racket cross. Square means hat 2 divided by 0 0.05. That means 5% level of significance 0.05. Into mean already calculated. Square. Square means hat 2. So by calculate by applying this formula for the first statement, the optimum sample size is 790.411. This procedure is followed for all the statements. For all the statements. See how to calculate standard deviation for all the statements. You click it and drag for all the 126 statements remaining. Then we will get the standard deviation for all the statements. Similarly, the optimal sample size is, can also be determined. The optimal sample size for all the remaining 127 statements can also be determined or calculated by dragging this row for all the 126 statements remaining. Remaining. So the optimal sample size for all the one twenty-seven statements is determined here. See, which is our optimum sample size? For the first statement, the mean value 3.52, standard deviation 2.524, n optimum sample size 790. Then second one, 445. Third one, 394 only. Fourth statement, 2. 
89. So, which is the highest one? The maximum n found to have against the first statement. The maximum n found to have against the first statement. For all the remaining statements, the n is much lesser. That means against the first statement only, we found the maximum n. The maximum n is 7, 90.411. So there is a condition, there is an assumption. If we have large sample size chosen for our study, definitely we, we may have more variation found in our data. That means the sample size is much larger definitely we will get more variation in our data. If we have more variation in our data, definitely we can interpret the outcome of the or the output of the analysis in a better way. So in order to interpret the results in a better way, definitely we may have more variation in our data. In order to get more variation in our data, we fix the maximum sample size. Optimum sample size. Here, the maximum n is found to be against uh, the first statement. Therefore, here the 790. And our sample size must be greater than 790, but should not be lesser than 790. Here, the optimum sample size means the maximum n found against any one of the statements we used for collection of data through PIRA study. So the data collected from PIRA study and we found the n which will be the maximum for any one of the statements and that maximum n will become our optimum sample size. Therefore our optimum sample size will be 790. The optimum sample size should not be less than 790. So this is the way in which we apply that validated formula for the determination of optimum sample size against the data collected through by the study. And that formula is much valid than other formulas already explained. So for that purpose, we conduct the pilot study based on the data collected through by the study. We apply that formula in the Excel format. In the Excel format, we calculate mean, we calculate standard deviation, then we apply the formula and find out the optimum sample size, which is the largest n found in any one of the statements used for our prior study. So thank you. Thank you very much for your patient listening. And this formula is much better than that formula already applied and some of the formula found in some of the test book available in statistics. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, dear participants, now it's time for clarifying your doubts. So for the next few minutes, uh, you can put your uh, questions in the chat box and Harisar will try to answer these uh, questions. Please uh, put your questions in the chat box. Sorry, sir, uh, already we received one question from uh, Mrs. Nasim A. The question is, sorry, sir, can you hear me? Oh, yes, uh, yes. Okay, yes. the question is, I can hear. The question from Nasim A is, can we use responses of three or five point scale? for determination of sample size? Of course, of course. But in that questionnaire, we use a seven point scale because we need more variation in our data. If you choose more, suppose if you use 10 point scale, definitely you may have more variation in your data. If you need more variation in your data, you can use either seven point scale or 10 point scale, whatever it may be. 
okay okay any other questions from the participants you can now uh, put your questions in the chat box so i think uh, no more questions so hari sir can we conclude degree uh, of freedom and level uh, one of significance question. degree of freedom and level of significance uh see degree of freedom can be identified only when we use this formula for the determination of optimal sample size in this formula we have make how chi square value table value of chi square at 1 degrees of freedom 3.841 so degrees of freedom has some relevance only when we apply this formula otherwise degrees of freedom has no value in the determination of sample size optimal sample size then so the nasim is asking uh, is it for a uh, finite population is it possible see finite population or infinite population is not relevant when we apply this formula when we apply this formula what is the importance this formula is applied against the information collected through pi rest all other formula already explained we will not consider the data and the variation in the population and what is the importance of pilot study by conducting the pilot study the researcher may be in a position to exactly identify the characteristics of the population the behavior of the population or understand what all things include in the population only through pilot study and we apply this formula against the data collected through pilot study that is why this formula is better than some other formula already explained so whether the population is finite or infinite that is immaterial we apply this formula for determination of optimal sample size against the data collected through pilot study that is why our optimum sample size will be the true representative of the population whether the population is finite or infinite that is immaterial then then one more question is there mm. uh, from uh, ponnu what type of sample method i can use for rural development <laughs> rural development you just specify what is the nature of the population what is your population what is your target group rural development so you mean you are target uh, target force is actually the rural people rural people hello i think he is uh, doing in rural business management so rural business management so who are the target population who are the respondents maybe rural people if you have rural people as you are a respondents definitely you can apply multi stage random survey that depends on how you define the population okay okay any other questions from the participants the hypothesis accept or fail to reject what is right <laughs> uh, what is the aim of formulating the hypothesis normally null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis there is no significant difference there is no significant dependence 
There is no significant relationship between these two variables. This is the nature of the null hypothesis. Are you interested in establishing there is no relation? No research scholar is interested to establish there is no research relation. We try to establish there must be some relation. That is why the basic objective of every research in social science is to accept the alternative hypothesis. Because in null hypothesis, there is no such a relation. There is no dependence. There is no relation. There is no association. There is no variation. So the basic objective of every research is to accept the alternative hypothesis and reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Then any other question? Sir, one question is there from Anub KG. Can you see that question? Is there any condition for the respondents in this by the study? I saw that question. It's a good question. Uh, suppose normally in every research thesis you can see the number of respondents in the pilot study 50. 50 to 100. But uh, I can't find uh, more than 100 respondents in a pilot study anywhere in the thesis. So 50 to 100 is an optimum units to be selected for our pilot study. So 50 to 100. There is no restriction. 5200 is okay. Then. Any other question? So, sir, I, I think we can conclude. So, no problem. 50 to 100, that's a reliable response for conducting the pilot study. Okay? So, I think there is one more question. Ah. By 5C Jahan, in my study, Million uh, viewers are respondents from Kerala. Which method can I use for data collection? Yes. Related to data collection. Who are the respondents? Uh, film viewers. Film viewers. Film viewers. Half the number uh, of respondents are there. Yeah. <laughs> so, multi stage sampling is the better method, but you have to define the targeted population. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Like you can uh, define the targeted population based on the classification of film. Yeah. Then? So participants can ask the, uh, directly ask questions to our resource person now. One or two questions. You can unmute your mic and ask questions. Yeah. Please. Otherwise both uh, Gracious and Pradeep will ask you. Your question, your candidates, your research scholar is to ask question. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, okay, sir. Vijay, sir, please ask some question. Vijay, sir. I think nobody is having. Ah, yes, Vijay, sir. Is... Mm. Sir, I have asked the questions uh, through the chatting. Two questions. I already asked you two questions. Hello? Uh, Hello, sir. Yes, I, I think it is answered. It is answered by our resource person. Oh, yes, sir, sir. Any uh, further questions? Okay, sir. Okay. 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 Hello, Harikumar, sir. Good evening. Yes. MBG. Good evening. Sir. Sir, my question is, uh, while uh, calculating Hello? the target population in the case of uh, multi-stage sampling, 
is the random analysis necessary or we are fixing one district from uh, this uh, south district has district. to be sir district has to be selected from each region at random random huh. otherwise we will call it as uh, multi stage sampling if you are applying <laughs> randomness then we can call it as multi stage, multi -stage random, random sampling, sampling. Uh, multi stage random sampling and multi stage random sampling it is better to say multi stage random sampling because every selection in every stage we have random so in one study we applied only multi stage mm -hmm. randomness is not followed we followed a randomness in only in randomness sample must from be, the target uh, population uh, randomness must be followed in every stage that is why there is that method is coming under probability sample Otherwise, that method cannot be called as random sampling. Random sampling. Okay. Okay, sir. Hello. Hello. Hello sir. Yes. James, sir, please. Uh, ah, okay. In the case of a predictive population mm. uh, with a different uh, characteristics, uh, that is heterogeneity, mm. uh, as uh, we can adopt, uh, as you said, the stratified random sampling. Each strata you have to uh, each strata you have to go for a proportionate selection uh, of items from each strata. Ah. Yeah. What are, is there any basis for that proportionate selection, sir? Uh, what is the proportion? How to determine that proportion? Sir, sir. I want to get uh, three hundred samples. Yes. And in the first strata. Yes. 200. Second starter, 500. Third starter, 300. Okay. So what is the proportion? 2 is to 5 is to 3. That can be adapted. That can be adapted. Anyway, okay. the final selection will be at random. Okay. Okay, thank you. Pradeep sir, uh, shall we conclude? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Okay. So I think uh, no more questions from the participants. So we are concluding this session. Now I invite Dr. Sunil Raj, Assistant Professor of uh, Department of Commerce, Government College at Ingle, to extend the word of thanks. Good evening, everybody. Sir, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And now it's time to express our out of thanks to our respected resource person, Dr. P. N. Harimar Sir. As all of us know, know that our research methodology is primary area in research, and it is also the area in which the researchers confront many problems. Today, our resource person, Dr. Harimar Sir, started from the very basics like topic selection, literature review, hypothesis setting, uh, different dimensions, dimensions of sampling and also sample size dimension in very detail. And I am sure that today's presentation will help all the participants in their future research activities. So on behalf of every participants and on behalf of behalf of a college, government college at Engel, I express my sincere thanks to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Rakesh, sir. Okay. See you again. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir.